So um, uh, I'm Gabe Sani. I'm um, uh, I'm going to talk about Wireless Toronto. Wireless Toronto is a, a group that um, <clears throat> that I'll tell you all about. Um, I'm going to start by saying by first talking why talking about why I'm talking about this. Um, uh, Wireless Toronto is a group that um, we started quite a while ago, and and it did some good work. Um, uh, we learned a lot, and some of it might be valuable to the sort of next generation of Wi-Fi organizations and movements. Um, the reality is that Wireless Toronto is in its final days. Um, you know, it's not dead, but it's really close. Um, this might be the last time that I talk about it, um, and I ha it's been years since I have. Um, and um, so it's so it feels like a bit of a f in the lead up to this, it's been feeling like a bit of a farewell. Um, so, so that's uh, that's sad, but but um, you know also inevitable. That um, and that one of the things that I've that I've, I've I've spent a lot of years thinking and talking to people about community wireless. Um, and and one of the things that I don't remember ever having a conversation about is how they end. Um, and so that, that that might not be the right conversation for us to have today. But I just want to flag that as something that like I don't know how these things stop. Um, and uh, and so if that so if this presentation feels a little wobbly, it might be because I'm strugg I'm still struggling with that. Um, uh, and so yeah, so I'm talking about this because some of this might be useful, um, not pr probably not all of it, uh, but um, uh, but I know that you know there are a lot of people here who are working on extremely cool projects, um, and um, uh, and that and that I know that when we were in the early days of starting Wireless Toronto. That um, that we had to put some really deliberate effort into remembering or, and, and and noticing and finding out what what kinds of initiatives came before us. And in fact, even though Wireless Toronto started in 2005, there was a community wireless group before us. It was called TAWNAG, T A W N A G. I don't even know what it stood for anymore. But they had their first meeting in 2002. Um, and I and I found uh, I found an email about it in like a listserv archive at some point. Um, but was never able to make contact with any of the people involved. Okay, uh, that is a sign that I'm talking too long. Uh, I'm going to try to keep this moving quickly and keep time for questions at the end. So, um, so what Wireless Toronto is is slash was? Um, it was a it's it's a group that uh, that's all about providing wireless internet access uh, that's free to use in public what we call public and publicly accessible spaces. Um, uh, so this is just this is basically like straight up hotspots. Um, by public and publicly accessible, we were pointing to the 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 difference that we understood between places that are truly public and places that only look or uh, seem public. So um, so a park would be public, but a cafe or restaurant might be publicly accessible, um, where there's a different set of rules at play around how we need to use those spaces. Um, and but the reason that we did that is because we were really interested in provide in the idea of what would happen when you uh, if con if like wireless connectivity was available in places in in community and cultural places where that access had never been provided before. Um, we were really ex excited about this idea of captive por of uh, community portal pages. So these were captive portal pages that we all know and hate. Um, but um, uh, but but actually, like, what are the other opportunities that can come along from that? Um, that actually um, that there's an interesting opportunity there to engage people. And so the way that we thought about those those community portal pages were kind of a speed bump on your way to the internet. That um, and that we were what we were hoping to do is reconnect Wi-Fi back to the physical place. That um, that this was uh, that that at the time people were this is the time when sort of like Wi-Fi hotspots were were um, starting to be rolled out and people were really freaking out about what they called the zombie effect. That thing that we're really used to now when you walk into a cafe and there's ten people and there's ten laptops and there's no conversation going on. Um, and we didn't like that either. Like we thought that that was a bad thing. That we were really excited about community and culture. We didn't want Wi-Fi to seem antisocial. And so we were. We hoped that that by um, with these community portal pages, which would be presenting information. This was before social media, so there was like no APIs available um, for to like whatever pull in location-based information. But we were in the sort of early days of that, where we were trying to find like what location-based information was po was possibly available in any kind of vaguely machine-readable form that we would be able to present in an automated way on these pages. Um, 
with, you know, one of the lines that we said was that um, the, both the terrible and wonderful thing about the internet is that it looks the same no matter where you connect to it from. That's not the case anymore with mobile, but at the, at the time it was, and, and with desktops it largely is. Um, and so we wanted these, these com community portal pages to be pages where that could kind of say, like, what does the internet look like from here? Or what does the internet have to say about this place? Um, and we likened it a bit to, um, to lower power FM community radio, which is like one of the really exciting precedents for us in the, those early Wi-Fi days, where, um, where we were actually using Wi-Fi's limited range as a strength rather than a weakness. That, um, that we really, that by having, by recognizing that the, the signal would only go so far, that could be a kind of like natural zone for us to think about what, um, what is this place? What is this place about? Um, I did it again. Uh, it was also about volunteerism, um, very, very deliberately so that, um, that, you know, we've, the, the, um, the people who initially formed Wireless Toronto and, and people who were attracted to it along the way were people who, who either had or who wanted to develop tech, their tech skills, um, you know, not, not exclusively, but largely. And, um, and that they saw this as a really exciting opportunity to use those tech skills for something besides whatever their job was. Um, that, uh, uh, that, they, that this is an opportunity for them to like, use those skills for something, um, for something the sort of greater good. Um, we never got very good at defining what the greater good was or how we were contributing to it, but there was a sense of that here um, and that this idea of Wi-Fi and public spaces made, made sense. Uh, made sense to them. And um, Alison Powell, who's a, who's a researcher working with Ilsenfield in Montreal, um, who was doing a lot of interviews with community wireless volunteers, had this, uh, uh, you know, uh, was the first person to ar sort of articulate this insight that, that these are people who had never volunteered for anything ever before in their lives and would probably not consider volunteering for anything else. Like they couldn't think of anything else that they would volunteer for, but that, they, but that this was something that they were really passionate about. Um, and that it was social and fun. Um, I mean, that doesn't seem like it's something that needs a lot of explanation, but, um, but it was actually a really core part of the sort of volunteer engagement part of what we were doing, that, um, that we recognized that if it wasn't social, and that, that, that this, the social and fun parts were actually an extremely strong motivator for, for what brought volunteers out and what got them to stay involved and engaged, that we liked hanging out with each other, we liked working together, we liked going for beers together, and that, um, I, I think it's really important to not forget about that piece that that without without that if we started if things started to get if things started to feel like too much work or that um, uh, or that things were getting less fun that um, we were on the wrong track. So I've said a little bit about context, but just to um, go a little deeper, 2005 was a long time ago, um, or it feels it seems like, it doesn't sound like a long time ago, but it, to me, I guess, as an old guy, but um, but it, there were things things were really different then. Um, that spring was when Rogers and the Second Cup launched a Wi-Fi service in Second Cup restaurants, which cost ten dollars an hour to use. Um, if, if you could actually like get a solid enough connection on your big clunky laptop and manage to get it to t accept your credit card. Um, and, uh, and there was barely any Wi-Fi at all in the city. Um, um, there, uh, there, there, there had been, there, there were in other cities that, um, you know, we, we looked to other cities uh, as inspiration, cities that had community wireless, um, uh, strong community wireless movements and organizations. But in Toronto, there wasn't much. And, and that was also the year, later that year was when the city of Toronto issued a request for proposals to, um, to what they presumed were big companies who were the only ones who would have the capability of setting up uh, Wi-Fi in Nathan Phillips Square. The, we submitted a, um, a, a proposal in response to that RFP. It was, I think, four pages. Um, and when I when I went to City Hall to like drop it off to drop off my little like my little envelope, there I saw on the desk the submissions from Rogers and Telus and Bell, which were in giant boxes, like big like file boxes, that they, like multiple boxes with their RFP proposals. The the the, the interesting restriction of that is like the the reason that we didn't make it very far in that is because the city required two million dollars of general liability insurance of whoever was installing that network, um, uh, which 
I, you know, hard to imagine what the liability would be in that situation, and, and that it, the network had to be installed at no cost to the city. And so our proposal was that we could set it up for $1,200, and so that was what disqualified us. In the end, um, in the, end the RFP was issued, but nothing was ever installed. Um, so, um, uh, so Wireless Toronto's goals were more for use Wi-Fi in more places. It was not, it, that, you know, to us that seemed adequately altruistic. Uh, that would not pass the sniff test today, I don't think. But, um, uh, but, but that was because we were, we, you know, we were, we, we were, we were approaching this kind of selfishly. Like we ourselves were people who wanted to use Wi-Fi in more, in more, in public places, and and it wasn't available. And we thought, okay, like let's roll up our sleeves and and, and figure out how we can make this happen. Um, we were not spending a lot of time thinking about the digital divide, about how this would, how, about how this was, um, uh, this was, this was not like about about equity or about anything like that. This was just kind of a, this is, we were still a bit like sort of techno technology focused in that respect. Like we just wanted this to be available in more places. Um, but we were thinking about community and culture and that, and that was the focus, that was why we had that focus on public and community spaces. Um, and what we're not is mesh. There were, I mean, sometimes we used mesh a little bit to just like help spread the signal a bit, but it was never, um, it was always just hotspot. Um, it was always just about hotspots. Um, I mentioned, a little bit about this, but like we were not particularly inclusive. Like we thought ourselves, thought of ourselves as being very welcoming and open, but we recognized that like our meetings were in bars um, downtown, and um, and you know that that um, it was it was not it was not nearly as inclusive as um, uh, as it could have been, um, or as it or as it should have been, and um, uh, and that we were very specifically not aiming to do to provide any coverage of private spaces that. That that's where that that's where things got really started to get complicated for us, um, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, a little bit about our stack. Uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of technology, and this is as deep into the technology as I'm going to get. But um, those were the we were using those devices, those black and blue boxes, um, and uh, a, a little piece of client software called Wi-Fi Dog um, that was connected to a, a piece of server software called AuthPuppy. If you want the complete instructions on what we did and how we set up these routers, they're all on our wiki. Um, and that uh, our, our legal stack was we had a, a venue agreement and a, a two-page agreement that we signed that we had each of our venues sign, and um, and then an end user terms of use that was one of those things that was linked from the captive portal page. That was I would say uh, admirably readable um, in, in comparison to a lot of those. Um, and um, and the, the way that the way that revenue worked is that the venue would pay for their own internet access, and they would purchase the equipment typically from us, so that it would be set up in advance um, at cost. And then they would pay the their the the only our only revenue was a fifty dollar a year network membership fee from each of the venues. Um, so that was enough money for us to cover our costs, which were not very high. We had to like buy the routers until we sold them. We had to pay for the web hosting. We had a a voice over IP phone line for people to call um, if they needed tech support, and we made stickers and brochures. Um, the um, and so so which is to say that we were like sustainable as a network. I would say that over the course of our of our life, um, we probably handled less than ten thousand um, dollars, and that we were. All, I guess I should also say that structurally we were a community group. There was no legal entity around this. Um, we had an an informal board. Um, uh, and uh, volunteers who we coordinated through um, through an email list, um, and we had a club bank account um, that uh, we, that we were able to get, which was um, which, which was which was helpful because we were receiving checks from venues. Um, so, and how venues saw it was that. Um, that this was more expensive. That like what we were offering was more expensive than setting up them, setting it, setting up their own Wi-Fi service. But um, for the, but most of them didn't want to do it themselves. They've got a business to run, and so or a, or a public venue to maintain. So um, they were very interested in having someone else come in and take care of that. And the alternatives to us were outstandingly expensive. Um, but Bell and Rogers and, and other companies were still trying to still imagining that there might be a business model around this, and. Um, and so it was. It's and and rightly, it is a fair bit of work. Um, and that and our, our volunteers were uh, had a very had a different set of motivations for why they wanted to do that than the folks who than the employees of those large companies. 
Mm. And um, so it's convenient to them because we would keep an eye on it. We would fix it if it went down, sometimes without them even notifying us because we were monitoring it and we could see. And, um, and that it was um, uh, very convenient for, them to, for, their, for us to be providing technical support for their users rather than, having to, rather than their staff having to worry about that. At our peak state, we had um, almost 40 hotspots. And our big ones were, um, were Dundas Square, St. Lawrence Market, Harbor Front Center, and Declan Grove Park. There's like, I, I could talk for a long time. I could tell like really, the, some, of, some of my like favorite stories about doing civic tech work were, were things that happened at those four venues. Um, it was, we just had a really great time getting access to strange you know, back rooms of of these and other and other venues, and um, and kind of and you know, fun conversations with the folks who run these places, and um, I think that that was one of the one of the, one of my favorite parts of doing this work was, was establishing um, the relationships with the with the with the small business owners and the public venue managers who who ran these places. Um, Current state, much smaller. Um, we've got three to four nodes. Depends if that one in Parkdale comes back up. Um, and uh, probably on the order of, of 10 to 30 connections a day. So still still exists, still up and running. People are still using it, but it's a it's a lot smaller scale. And you know, if any of these go, goes, if that Parkdale one doesn't come back down, doesn't come back up, then you know, we're just gonna call it dead. No one's gonna, no one's gonna go try to fix it. Um, we did a lot of experiments and side projects. I won't go into a lot of detail on these, but like, you know, at the time when um, uh, when packet data or cell cell data was still like, you know, a, a dollar or twenty bucks a meg, I think something like that was what it was at the time. Um, that the idea of having mobile Wi-Fi was very novel, but we but we hacked something together um, that we were able to, to take to events in a backpack. That uh, we worked on this cool project with folks in in Montreal, where we would actually install. We you know, we were really excited about look sort of culture and community in different places, and so we would install local um, storage devices and start plugging and with that had cool content on it, and that we would start presenting that on those community portal pages, so that there'd be sort of uh, uh, internet connected information that you'd only be able to access at certain places. Um, we experimented a little bit with that. Um, we there was this thing called um, Auto Oz. There was a network in Toronto called OneZone that was run initially set up by Toronto Hydro and then sold to Kojiko. It doesn't exist anymore, but um, uh, for a while they, um, uh, they, you, they were offering like five, $5 a month unlimited access to, um, uh, to mobile devices. Um, and we wrote a little script that would just allow us to use that as backhaul for our, um, for our nodes. And so for a little while, the St. Lawrence Market hotspot was running on that, where it would just like auto enter my credit card number um, into their captive portal in order to log in every month when it, when it kicked us off. Um, and then Insight was a great project that we did. It was an art project where um, a, a, a local uh, sort of technology art curator um, commissioned four artists to develop site-specific artworks that were specifically for, to, that, uh, that specifically were for display on our community portal pages. So you would have to go to that look, not just have to go to that location, but have to go to that location and open up your laptop in order to see uh, or, or experience their artworks, which is, which is a really great project. So what we did well, uh, the th and or sort of the things that I'm proudest of um, that you know we demonstrated that Wi-Fi doesn't need to be expensive to set up or run. Um, that like when you go to to the Second Cup or Starbucks now, you don't have to pay ten dollars an hour for Wi-Fi. I don't take we don't take full credit for that, but um, uh, but that I, I think it really woke people up. It, it sort of accelerated people's understanding of like Wi-Fi actually can be quite easy. On the flip side of that, we made the case for one nine reliability. Um, this is something that that, uh, that like. You know, we, we very explicitly said that like we, this is not, we're, we're not, as a volunteer organization, like we are not about high reliability access. We're not, we don't want to be anyone's primary access to the internet. That is way too much pressure for a volunteer group. We're totally fine with secondary access. 90, 95% uptime, totally good enough for us. You know, we'll do support on a best effort basis, but, um, but but that's but you know so I think it took it took some work to set that expectation with people. Um, but I think that we did a good we we did a pretty good job of that by reminding people that this is a volunteer effort, um, and by trying to trying to 
move them away from, from a very commercial uh, uh, or a consumer idea of, of internet access. The metaphor that we use sometimes was a drinking fountain. It's like at home, um, you have water service. It's very reliable. At the park, there's a drinking fountain. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it's a little bit weird. That's us. Um, <laughs> Uh, we also engaged a really great and weird bunch of people with a, with a wide range of skills. Um, uh, this photo and a couple others are from the, uh, the launch of our service in Dufferin Grove Park, which is one of our favorite, um, favorite projects. Um, we were part of a global movement connected to, the, to similar community wireless groups in other cities through uh, sort of like through mailing lists and, and by sharing technology and stories and through occasional times when we would get together um, uh, in conferences. I think we documented our work pretty well. We, um, uh, on, we've got a, a wiki, wiki.wirelesstoronto.ca that basically has everything, all of our collective knowledge is basically all there. Um, only, the, only the really sensitive stuff is behind, is password protected, everything else is wide open. Um, and writing, um, there we, you know, we did, we, I guess we got some good media coverage, um, but also we did some of our own writing. Um, Hannah Cho and Dory Kornfeld, who were two people who were involved pretty um, substantially in the earlier days, wrote a really great article that appeared in the first um, edition of um, the Ut Utopia, Utopia book series that K uh, Coach House Press published. Um, that was kind of about situating um, community Wi-Fi in a sort of like larger civic city building context, which is a really, which I think really helped accelerate a lot of our thinking about the value of this work. What well, we did not as well, um, resilience, managing volunteer burnout and reducing the, our reliance on a few people. Um, that, um, uh, that's a hard thing to manage um, uh, and we, we definitely were uh, sort of suffered from it. Um, identifying and articulating our impact, I think that we would have been able to get a lot further if we had, that this, stuff is, this stuff is hard and it's really different from the kind of skills required to um, install and maintain a Wi-Fi network. So, uh, uh, getting people involved and, and really prioritizing that understanding and measuring our impact would have been really good, I think, for us um, to, uh, to, to better understand the relationship that we were having, um, the, the impact that we were having uh, overall and being able to communicate that. Um, effective governance, we didn't do a great job of. Um, you know, we had a, I mentioned that we had a, a kind of volunteer informal board but um, but it wasn't it wasn't very functional. We had uh, we had monthly meetings, but they were inconsistent. Um, and uh, and w really, when it came down to it, it was sort of uh, a small number of people who were kind of making the decisions for how things went. Um, and that uh, and then on the other side, you know, being able to offer consistent volunteer engagement and user support and venue support would have really helped strengthen our reputation and 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 attract and and keep more people involved for longer. So these none of these are none of these are easy things, um, but uh, we these are things that we um, that we didn't do a great job of that we could have done a better job of. And along those lines, you know, like sort of personally, kind of what I learned, and, and perhaps others as well, but certainly me, uh, what I learned from, from doing this work is, uh, well, there's virtually everything I know about organizing a group of people to get stuff done comes from, comes from experiences that I had at Wireless Toronto. The importance of non-tech skills to civic tech projects, that's, uh, that's that, that you know that remains a question that folks in the civic tech community talk about a lot, but um, but it, it was very tangible for me the the um, what was the, the 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 great enormous value that we got from the non technological non tech skill contributors. At least in our experience, and this may not be the case everywhere, but in our experience, very much uh, that the, the volunteers who were attracted to Wireless Toronto were people who wanted to learn and were really interested in the sort of social and fun aspects of it, that, um, that it wasn't, that, that, that the sort of, the, the bigger mission was important in, in the abstract, but, but only to sort of get in the door. And after that, it had to be the sort of the fun and the learning that maintained their interest. Volunteers want leaders to lead, meaning that, um, uh, you know, as much as, as, much as I, I really like the idea of people just kind of sorting things out on their own, um, that, there's, that there is a really important role for leadership and vision and decisions being made and structures being adopted. And, and those, those should be ones that are 
that everyone feels like they have some that have the opportunity to offer feedback into. But if you rely on people's like sort of organic contribution to that, it, it gets a lot. Um, things slow down a lot and and often can lose momentum. Um, knowing how and when it's okay to break rules. This photo is of one of our volunteers, um, uh, like. In installing a, uh, a, a weatherproof box on the exterior of a City of Toronto building um, in Dufferin Grove Park that, you know, it turns out there are times when you can like drill into public infrastructure and that the staff there will be like totally will cover you. Um, uh, so, you, you know, it, it's, I wouldn't want to do that all the time, but in certain cases, like it's actually, you, you, can, you can create the conditions for that to, for that to be okay. Um, how the world looks from the perspective of small business owners. I said a little bit about this, but um, that small business owners are um, incredible, in, in, in my experience working on this, incredible, incredible people that they've, they've got such an amazing um, set, set of, of motivations that are so different from the way that I ha had, been, had been looking at the world. And so it was just so, um, uh, it's such a great opportunity to have the chance to work with them and see 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 the world um, as it appears from their perspective. And some of their kitchens are very greasy. <laughs> really, like sort of the Wi-Fi router would go, the Wi-Fi would go down, and so then we'd have to like crawl underneath the like cache or the like fry machine or whatever in order to figure it. Be like you'd scrape the grease off of the Wi-Fi router. It was crazy. Um, that's that's what I got. Um, it, um, I uh, you know I'm really. I'm, ex I'm I'm really proud of the work that we did with Wireless Toronto. Um, I'm I'm it, it played such a really important role in my own uh, kind of development as a community organizer and, and person who works in civic tech. And um, uh, so I I hope that there's something in here that's been that's been a value to the folks who are doing this work going forward. Um, I'm really happy to answer questions um, and. Um, uh, talk uh, and you know and, and share more about what we're doing. I, I don't know which parts of this are, would be most valuable to you. I know that the objectives of Wireless Toronto are really different from some of the objectives of the Wi-Fi projects that are in this room now. But um, um, I you know I'd like to you know, really really want to hear more about the stuff that people are working on and how if there's anything from this that that resonates with you. Also. Um, you know, if there's anything, any of the, any of our learning, but also kind of assets that we can offer, um, you know, as I said, Wireless Toronto is in its closing days. We've got a couple of boxes full of Wi-Fi gear in my shed. Um, we've got three nodes that are still up and running that maybe could be adapted to other use. Um, uh, we've got, I've got a whole pile of, t of these t-shirts with me. If anyone wants one, um, let me know. I'm up. Yeah. <laughs> uh, great. So, I mean, that's, that's all I got in terms of, in terms of talking, but I'd really love to hear and, and, uh, and, and chat about what people are thinking. Hi, sorry, we have a roving mic. Can I ask you to just uh, restate your question? Uh, hi, Gabe. Uh, I don't really know anything about the history of mesh networking, but can you talk about your project in, in relation to that? Thanks. Sure. Uh, uh, I, I think that the next presenter is going to talk a lot more about, about the history of mesh projects. So, and, and frankly, that's total, it's not my, I, I, it's something that I really, um, monitored the uh, the sort of early evolution of because um, it was happening at the same time as this work but um, I'd say the the difference is uh, I, I, I'm gonna do I'm not gonna do a great job of this but I'm, I'll give it a shot um, I'd say that you know what we were what 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 wireless Toronto was really interested in was it was about providing um, free to use Wi-Fi in public and publicly accessible spaces and and that was out of uh, out of an interest in how do people use public spaces in the city and how might um, like, uh, like free connectivity, free internet connectivity, as well as those community portal pages, that idea of like local, in how could that contribute to the way that those spaces were used? And so, you know, an example of that is um, 
Uh, you know, we, we were all kind of um, urban planning. Um, n none of us, had, I think, had an urban planning background, but we all really were interested in that field. And, and you know, w one of the things that, that we understood was that the more different kinds that you could, that as a general rule of thumb, like the, the kind of the, val the sort of civic value of a place um, could be in part assessed based on the different kinds of simultaneous uses of that space. If you've got a space that where only one thing happens, it's less likely to be valuable than a space where a lot of things happen. And, that, and that's, that's why parks are great. So if, we could, if, if the availability of connectivity could add additional uses to a space, we thought that might be a cool thing to, to explore. So I won't comment on what the objectives of mesh projects are, but I think they're different from that. Hi, uh, I just want to say a massive thank you. We don't often smart them where we can actually learn a bunch of stuff from people delivering on what went right and what went wrong. I think we like the more of this we could hear would be amazing. So I'm really appreciative. Uh, and it, it seems like you came with one really potentially a very honest uh, conclusion. And I was interested in knowing when you came to the conclusion. Uh, during your presentation, you said we were never really good at identifying the greater good that we were aiming at. Mm. Uh, like, when did that in like in your Thinking about the project, was there a point where that came forward? I, I mean, I think that the, um, the 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 first time that that idea was sort of presented to us was when we were talking to people who, when like basically when we were talking to people uh, from organ from grant making organizations, where we who we would talk to and be like, hey, we're doing this cool community thing. You want to give us a pile of money? And they would say, well, what's what impact are you having on the community? And we'd be like, eh, you know, we're putting Wi-Fi, and um, and that that and that to, to their response being like not really being able to connect the dots on that. Um, that was when we we're like, oh, okay. And so I think you know we responded to that by just like not going, not trying to get grants. That you know we got we got very few. We didn't try very hard. Our model didn't depend on that. Um, we were really happy to just keep doing the like installing routers and drilling into walls. That, that was totally. That we were happy with doing that. We didn't really need grants in order to do the, what we what the the core of what we needed to do. Um, and I don't think regret that. Like I don't think it would. I don't think that it would have been great for us to regret. I think that would have just we would have spun our wheels on a bunch of stuff that we weren't maybe very good at. But now, but today, you know, I, um, where I understand that a little bit better and understand the importance of being able to articulate and or or, or potentially measure or or in some way to sort of assess the positive impact that you're having if that's what your intent is, um, I see that being a real limitation now. On uh, you know, at this stage, I can talk about how many connections per day we had. I can talk about how many Wi-Fi spots we had. I've got nothing else. To say in terms like what was the sort of civic or community impact legacy of this project? I got nothing. I got I got I just have logs, you know. So that it's that, which is you know maybe okay, but it might be a missed opportunity. So with the new and projects coming up with somewhat different objectives, as you mentioned. Um, What's like a couple of lessons you'd say, I wish these guys would learn from my experience? Other than I, the ones I you will, already mentioned, right? I, I, will, I will politely decline to answer that question directly um, because, uh, because I, I just honestly don't feel like I know enough about, about I haven't been following the, 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 the recent movements closely enough to say. Um, but I mean, I think some of, the things, some of the things to offer and some of the things that I suspect might be... Um, might be challenges uh, have to do with how do you engage non-tech skills, um, and so some of the buttons is sometimes a way to do that. Not just buttons, but you know, as an example of that, um, there's uh, also like how do you how do you talk to a really wide range of people about this? It's one thing to get um, a bunch of uh, like kind of network nerds in a room and and really get excited about buildings about routing you know protocols or something, but um, but it's really different to be able to explain that to um, someone who's got like a building owner who's got like the perfect location right like that's a very different kind of story that you need to tell and and so those are those are skills that we developed over time um, and I guess it's. There's, there's the how do you tell the story, but there's also recognizing the reliance on different people. You know, like for us, if we hadn't, 
if, if we, um, we secured St. Lawrence Market as a Wi-Fi hotspot in our first year, like in less than a year after we launched. And that was a huge boost to us. Like we got in the National Post and we got a bunch of other um, media coverage because of that. And um, uh, and so that was a really huge, that was a really, it was a really important boost for us. But the only reason that that happened is because um, I knew a guy who knew a guy. Uh, and that like if it hadn't been for that, for that pre-existing, like very random pre-existing relationship, um, that there's like there's no way that we would have we would have landed that, and so I think that that it's important to have those sort of community connections and like a sort of strong and broad network of people. Um, I mean, I don't know. Those are just two two things that, that come to mind. So yeah, I'm just curious, like how you came to all be together. How d how did we meet the people who who, who sort of who, who made Wireless Toronto? Um, there was um, so I mentioned that there was a wireless group before. I didn't know any of those people. We tried reaching out, um, uh, like I sent emails to all the email addresses I could find. Wireless Toronto. It actually like very strangely. Um, there, I mean, there, there were there there were a few groups of people who were interested in kind of tech for social good. There was this um, a group called Social Tech Brewing that like met for beers uh, every, May. and so there were some folks from that who got involved or who kind of spread the word a little bit. Um, our our very first like meeting, uh, which was sort of just a call out to be like, hey, would anyone be interested in wireless in Toronto? Um, we had it in in April 2005 at the at the Center for Social Innovation on Spadina, and and like 50 people showed up. Like I think it was just one of those things where like at the time it, it was all about email lists. Like it was like listserv mania, and so we put out a call and it just got shared on different lists and different lists and different lists. And 50 people, most of whom I didn't know, showed up. Um, and um, and then maybe only 20 people came to the second meeting, and then it went down from there. But um, uh, I don't know really where they. I, I, mostly, I don't know where they came from. Most, in fact, like there's a whole generation of friends that I have that I met through Wireless Toronto, and I don't know how they found out about it. Um, that, that I get uh, probably on a listserv somewhere, um, and um, but that but that there were just there were enough people who were attracted to it uh, that they came and they thought it was cool and they stuck around. It just like fit for them based on where they were in their life and for what they were looking for as a thing to get involved in. Um, but it was a really broad group of people. There were like there were there were grad students who had never touched a router before. Um, th there were um, uh, there were like you know people who people who built websites, and there were people who worked on networking, and there were people who um, had never done any of those things, but were really interested in learning. That's not a very satisfying answer to your question, but they kind of they just came out of the woodwork. I, so I think it, all to say that like finding ways of getting the message out there, which is a little bit harder to do today than it was then, can be important. <laughs> I, I can shout. Uh, I'd like to, that, okay. I, I, I can stand up and now. But, oh, oh, it's gotta be on the stream, my bad. Um, yeah, I like the uh, art project idea, the insight. I kind of wanted to just know a little bit more about that. Like, what were some of the like pieces that were showing? Where is it like early AR? Or was it like just like you log into this page, you can see something cool, or did it like actually like correspond with things in reality? So, just like maybe a few examples yeah. of what you were doing. Yeah, yeah. Artists just will like defy any expectation you you put in front of them. So, so. Um, uh, I'm going to try to remember. There's only I'm I can, I'm only right now remembering two of the pieces, but um, one of them was uh, uh, there were there were a bunch there were a few MP3s that uh, that this artist had. So they were you know they were sound. 
they were, I think they were like sort of music mashups that he, that he had made somehow responding to, I think, interactions that he, like he had gone to the place and he had like chatted with some people and I, I forget what it was exactly, but that somehow that inspired hit him to make, it was either a playlist or like a sort of series of music of, of like song mashups that he made that were, spe- that, that were venue specific for him. One of the other um, artists like went to this. She did. She did her piece in Dundas Square, and she um, uh, and she took very precise measurements of Dundas Square, and then and then basically like made a verbal description of that. Like she'd made an audio recording of her of her reading out the dimensions of the space, and then also created like wrote, like transcribed it in a way that looked that was very poetic um, and that those were the, those were her two pieces and the thing so like you know very uh, like um, super super interesting and site specific pieces and that used a range of media um, I uh, I also apologize that I'm not going to be able to stay this afternoon for the workshop that is on the calendar. Um, I'm a new, new-ish dad and um, still figuring out when it's okay and not okay to um, be away. And so I got I, I'm I'm cool for this morning, but I can't stay for the afternoon. So um, if um if there are things that people want to uh, ask about or learn more about about Wireless Toronto, especially the Toronto Mesh crew, I would be really happy to have more longer conversations with you um, any any time yeah <laughs> can I ask a question yeah <laughs> I am always really uh, or I wonder and um, would love your thoughts on kind of like when like is it okay if you make a project like this and it does not sustainable like it's a temporary intervention um, and, and I really uh, liked how you mentioned like what you thought this might have done to sort of change or reframe a conversation or like make it not an option to have expensive public Wi-Fi. Um, yeah, I don't know, do you have any more thoughts on that? Uh, and or like maybe how like tactically there could be like a good, a good site to like imagine this being temporary to affect like a certain type of change? Um, I mean, I think that's a, I, I, I like that idea so much, um, but I, I think, but it's, it, it's hard for me to, to think about that in the context of Wireless Toronto because um, in order to sustain our own excitement about the work and in order to sustain volunteers' excitement about the work, it has to be so big picture and visionary and changing the world. Um, and that it's hard, I mean, I, I really like the idea of like setting a goal, be like in the next two years, we're gonna have this amount, we're gonna do this amount of work and have this amount of impact and to be able to frame that on a temporary basis. But um, uh, because then it feels like there's something really concrete for us to be um, uh, like a goal for us to achieve. But that then conflicts with like people's availability and the progress that you actually make, make towards those milestones along the way. And so having a kind of, um, so I, I mean, I think that maybe it's lazy, but um, but I think that it's just it's a lot easier to have a kind of abstract future, unspecified timeline goal for that. Um, I, except I guess when there's like a very immediate opportunity, right? So like when that Nathan Phillips, when that like really random, poorly designed Nathan Phillips Square RFP came out, and you know like it sort of that got us excited about like figuring out what, what would our approach be to responding to a thing like that and putting and doing the work to put that together, which had a very a very firm deadline. Um, and um, uh, and other kinds of things like that, where there was, you know, over the years, there've been like so many different proposals or ideas or sort of media stories about should, like should Toronto have municipal Wi-Fi and, and all that stuff. And so at various moments, we've like, try to take advantage of the opportunities of that idea being in the public eye in order to advance some of our own um, uh, approaches. So I think in, in those contexts, um, it, it is, it's easier to, to move things quickly on a sort of temporary and time-limited basis, but um, we never figured out how to go beyond that, yeah. One, one idea relating to that that we've thought about uh, in Oakland with People's Ultimate Network is doing things for uh, demonstrations and for homeless encampments. Those are the two that we've like really talked a lot about as being potential like temporary, like we just throw out, but 
since we're already an ongoing project, it's a little bit easier. It's not like we're our, that's not our main thing we're doing, but it's something that we could do in addition to what we do. So it's kind of just wanted to share that idea. Totally. Yeah. I mean, I think event events and and um, and and protests and movements are, are that are that are really um, timely are are great for that. And I guess maybe the closest we got were kind of like major network installs or refreshes. Like the our, the 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 times that we got like thirty people to come out was when we were doing installs at at um, St. Lawrence Market or Young Dundas Square or Dufferin Grove Park. Big big ones like that. Questions? Oh, thank you, Gabe. Cool. Thanks a lot. <laughs>